This is Sheriff Spotlight with the Rockingham County Sheriff's Office, highlighting the office and deputies dedicated to providing law enforcement services and maintaining the trust and support of Rockingham County citizens, all while keeping neighborhoods and communities safe. Good morning, I'm Sheriff Sam Page, and today we're uh, having our Sheriff Spotlight for January 2021. And congratulations, Marcus, we're into a new year. I have Captain Marcus Marshall, and Marcus is with our uh, Detective Division. He's our commander of our Detective Division. Mm -hmm. Marcus, we're going to talk about you and some of the things you've done over the years and, and your involvement in law enforcement at the Rockingham County Sheriff's Office mm -hmm. and a little bit about yourself here. So we're going to go through several things here. Mm -hmm. So are you ready for a lot of talk right now? Uh, I'm ready, Sheriff. Go ahead. Okay. Well, well here we go. Uh, first of all, I'd like to wish you, your family, and everyone that's listening and watching uh, Happy New Year this year. And at this time, again, we have Captain Marcus Marshall. He's our commander of our Detective Division of the Rockingham County Sheriff's Office. Uh, Marcus, I'd like for you to tell the audience a little bit about yourself, uh, you know, how long you lived in Rockingham County, a little bit about family and stuff like this, kind of what's going on there, because you've got some exciting things with your family, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, first of all, I'll, I'm Marcus Marshall. And again, I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, and um, left New York in 1976 and came here uh, graduated from Reedsville High School. Um, so you're a Reedsville Ram? I am a Reedsville Ram. All oh, right. Um, after graduating from Reedsville High School, I, I worked in retail for uh, about 15 years and then um, decided in 1997 I wanted to go into law enforcement. Um, and I went to BLET at uh, Rockingham Community College. Well, I've got to ask you a question. I've got to ask you a question. What, what drew you to law enforcement? How did you gravitate to law enforcement? What brought you there? Well, to be honest with you, uh, about eight, when I was living in New York and I was about eight years old, I um, was downstairs on the subway, and um, it was just something about the uniform that the officer was wearing. And, and I looked at my mother and I told her I wanted to be a, a law enforcement officer. And so you were looking at those New York uh, City police officers, blue uniforms and everything? It, it just caught my eye. Oh wow! Yeah, and and so you went through you went through rookie school here locally at the Rockingham County. I did at the community college. Yes, sir. That was in 1997, BLET at RCC, and oh. um, after completing the six month school, um, actually was hired uh, in January of 1997 and went into um, started out in detention. And um, now for everybody, detention is the jail facility. Yes, sir. And uh, it's it and it has its own challenges. Uh, not everybody that works in the jail are sworn. Uh, they are certified as detention officers mm -hmm. and they have requirements that they have to go through. But but also we do have some personnel that are sworn detention officers, sworn, have full arrest powers, or they're working in a detention capacity. So tell them a little bit about uh, detention. How was your how was your early days in detention? Oh, it was um it was it was, it was a good learning experience, I, I have to say that. Um, and like I said again I started out in nineteen ninety seven in January, um, and then six month in six months in I went to um, the BLET program and um, got my law enforcement um, certification. Now, once you got certified, did you go back into detention or did you go into another role? I went back into detention for uh, probably about three or four months and then um, actually um, was assigned to a unit called community policing. Uh, it was called the COPS unit um, and basically that entailed um, kind of going back to the old way of policing, um, kind of like the, the um, Andy Griffin days where you actually, you, instead of just riding through a neighborhood, you actually get out of your vehicle and you stop, you talk to people. And, um, Community involvement. Yes, sir. It was more of that. Yes, sir. So, so, and a lot, of, a lot of people don't know, but uh, when President Clinton was in, mm -hmm. his, his goal through the COPS program, when they, we got the COPS pro program moving, is he wanted to put 100,000 police officers on mm -hmm. the street, and they were able to do that. That's right. I think now in the United States, we have nearly, I think, 750 to over 800,000 police officers across the whole country. Mm -hmm. So uh, so you were part of that program. Yes, sir. Now, was that a grant program originally? Uh, yes, sir, it was a grant program. Okay, and, and there were some other people. Who were some of the people oh, that were also working with you on the COPS program? Um, we had a sergeant, which was uh, Sergeant Jerry Fowler, and then we had... I talked to Jerry the other um, day. We had Leotis Chestnut, who is now retired. Uh, we had, uh, to some people, well, they were um, Tyrone Chestnut. Right, yeah. and... Um, I, um, we also had Dwayne Anders um, was part of that unit. Who's currently back working Who's with us? Currently CDN? back with us. Um, Chester Eads was part of that unit, also, and he's retired. Um, 
And we have uh, Tim. Tim Newman, who's a lieutenant on patrol. Lieutenant that Tim was Newman. with us. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Absolutely. So, and some, some of those persons are still here. Yes, sir. Okay. They are. Well, the Community Oriented Policing uh, COPS program uh, has been very beneficial. Uh, the thing about it is it's non-traditional. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what, you, and l what it is is a lot of times our, our deputies now, they spend a lot of time going from call to call to call, and they don't have quite as much time sometimes to stop and talk, right. stop and ask questions, uh, just or meet, meet the public. Mm -hmm. uh, but with the Community Oriented Policing or the COPS program, you have more time. You are assigned to certain areas or, or certain events, and, and basically, you had that time to interact with the public more. We did. Uh huh. And it kind of educate and educate about kind of what we do. A little bit of crime prevention there too, yes. wasn't it? Um, and, 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 and it was a, a personal. Um, you know, you got very personal with your businesses because that's one of the things that we did. We we stayed in touch with our businesses. Each each um, officer was assigned an area, so we were divided into four areas. So you you had the west side, you had the east side, the north side and the south side of the county. And uh, I was assigned to the Reedsville south end of the county. And, um, and, and you know, again, we're interacting with those businesses, going into communities, actually getting out, talking with people, and they know who their community policing officer is. And mm -hmm. a lot of times when crime would happen, um, they would call us first. We would like for them to call 911 first. They, but, they'd call you before they, they call 911. They would call us before they call mm -hmm. 911, yes sir. Because you built the trust, yes, and, and and again they knew you. They had a face, a name, mm -hmm. and a number, and they would call you. That's right. Like this. Well, what do you, what do you think is your uh, most significant? Uh, did you have a most significant case or cases that you worked on, or any areas you worked on uh, when you were with, with the cops program? One um, in particular, um, um, we also was assigned to the detective division, and so we we answered um, handled a lot of. The, the smaller, um, like property crimes, um, would be like damaged mailbox, missing persons, and one that I can say specifically was a missing person case. I was in COP uh, at that time, and it, and um, the missing person case ended up becoming a homicide case, and it was a Jonathan Blackwell case. Mm -hmm. You and, were very um, involved in that case, and I worked that case from start to finish, and and even at the the end, um, before the end of the case, I got moved to another division um, within the agency, but I still worked that case, and, um, and, and, and we was very successful and was able to make an arrest there. Well, well, the cops, uh, cops deputies were also, uh, I think, were instrumental, and in, we had a uh, certain area, Candy Creek area, they mm -hmm. had a lot, a lot of problems down that area. When, you, when I first came in office, mm -hmm. and you guys concentrated that area, um, they had persons that were selling drugs, mm -hmm. uh, open air yes, sir. Uh, drug sales. And you pr pretty much let the persons know that it's not going to be tolerated, That's right. and uh, moved them out of there. We did, okay. and, we and, and I attribute program. that to the uh, the efforts from the cops program. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you doing that, uh, Marcus. Now, y you started out in detention, and then you went to the cops program. Yes, sir. After you got certified, you went to cops program, and and you interfaced a little bit with detectives. You interfaced a little bit with crime prevention. So you got you're getting some good exposure here mm -hmm. and stuff. And then, all of a sudden, you go into detectives? <laughs> now, you went into detectives for a while, yes, right? Sir. Yes, sir. And even before that, sir, um, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, after being in a cops program, I stayed in cops for about six years, mm -hmm. um, and then I became a sergeant in, um, in community policing. Mm -hmm. um, still was assigned to detective division, and after leaving um, the cops unit, um, I got promoted to um, I went back to detention, but I went back as a captain over um, detention. And um, then left from captain of detention, um, I went into civil for about three years and worked in the civil division. You know, I missed that. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and then I left the civil division after three years, and in 2013, uh, 2013 went back into detectives, and I've been in detectives since. Now, see, a lot of people, i got to go back to civil. Because we can't ignore civil. You know, the primary responsibilities of the sheriff's office is running a jail, mm -hmm. is civil process, yes, and maintaining security for the courts. That's right. And so it sounds like you're start, you have worked in just every area of the primary responsibility, core responsibilities of the sheriff's office. Yes, sir. All those areas. Yes, sir. But on the civil process, it's very important mm -hmm. because that covers everything from evictions. That's right. Uh, uh, where people are owed money. Or, or people need to remove somebody from the rest of the like. But anyway, it's it's a lot of responsibility there. It is. And okay. And then you went you went back in detectives, and then you were promoted to captain of the detectives. Well, just before captain, uh -huh. um, yes, I was promoted to captain.
But just before Captain, um, I was actually lieutenant in detectives um, for a very short period, and then from lieutenant of detectives, I went straight into, um, I think I was like four months of a lieutenant, and then I went straight into a captain. All right, let me just ask you this. Uh, as, a, as a captain of detectives, you have a lot of responsibilities. It's a lot of responsibilities. You interface with the sheriff regular, right? Yes, sir. Because the sheriff talks to you about how's this case going, <laughs> or is that case moving forward? That's right. Uh, you worked on a lot of homicide cases. Yes, sir, I have. And uh, uh, I was going to say, tell a little bit what it's like to be that guy, the chief investigator for the sheriff's office, uh, some brief brief duties and responsibilities, and, and how it impacts you. Well, Because you are impacted. Yes, by yes sir, I am. And, and, and Sheriff, the, the way I look at it as a chief investigator, um, I think about the responsibilities that you have as a sheriff. You are the high, and you're the high elected sheriff. And I know there's other agencies that have lieutenants and, and captains, but to be a chief investigator for the sheriff of a county, that is a very, I take that, I don't take that position lightly. I, I take it with a, a lot of respect and, um, and it is a lot of responsibility and duties for the, for the captain. Um, my primary duties is to oversee the operations of um, the criminal division. And all investigations. And all the investigations. Also, um, the narcotics division is also assigned to our detective division. So I oversee the narcotics division also. And, and, and a few thousand cases a year that have to be overseen, and those are many victims. Yes, sir. We have a lot of victims. Yes, and, um, and, and that is our primary, that is our primary responsibility as detectives is that the victims are who we work for. We put the victims first. Yes, sir, we do. Um, again, um, there is 18 detectives that I oversee in, in, in the detective division in narcotics, um, and our primary responsibility is, again, as we come in and we, we read the reports from the night before that was taken from the patrol division, um, we, we have up to seven days where we try to not, we try to do it in less than seven days to make Recon contact. Yeah, the we public. contact the victims uh -huh. and um, we follow up basically on um, any leads that we have just based off the report. But then we go out and we talk to the victims. We go out and we have to interview people in the neighborhood in order to, um, you know, to, to go as far as we can with those leads to see if we are able to find, you know, who, who actually victimized these, these individuals. So as a detective, you've got to be able to communicate. Yes, sir. That's, and that's communicate to your, the men and women that work in the detective division and also being able to communicate with the public. That's right. Um, now, we participate not only in the local investigations, mm -hmm. but we, we work in conjunction with state and federal. Mm -hmm. um, Tell a little bit about oh, why it's important that we have task, we participate in task forces, these federal task forces. Very important. Um, I have one um, detective that is assigned to HSI, which is Homeland Security, and also have another detective that is assigned to the DEA task force, which is a drug um, enforcement. And uh, this is on the federal level. Very important and, and great that we have that partnership and working relationship with those agencies. What it does is it brings in extra resources for us, um, different operations that we work um, we'll use drugs for an example. Um, we know a, a lot of our drugs are, are coming from the, from the borders and, and they're coming from the south, they're coming up funneled into our county. So, and there, so different tra there are different trafficking routes but a lot of our drugs we see coming from our southern border with Mexico. That's right, that's right. And then and it moves into across North Carolina and other parts of the country. Being part of that task force, does that give you an extra ear uh, to understand an eye about how stuff's coming in and how to combat that problem. It does. And it's been it's beneficial. And it's been very beneficial. And um, and you know, and, and, and when these when we're able to to t um, stop these drug dealers and and be able to apprehend them, um, you know, it brings in federal dollars for us too, because we we go after their money. Oh, we you, now you're talking money. about now you're talking about asset forces. So, yes, sir. So if you work with the federal government, mm -hmm. uh, you're working with the task force, and say for example, they seize a million dollars in assets, those assets can be taken and redistributed to the investigative agencies involved, correct? Yes, yes sir. And, and also, um, one of the good things with that forfeiture money, not only does it help us with equipment, but it also helps us on the investigation side of it. If, if we need to reach out to um, other facilities um, to do for, of extra forensic stuff for that we us. normally couldn't do. That we couldn't do here where we're limited. We at. can use those funds we can use for that those purpose. Funds, exactly. So basically, you're saying those fun, that when you go out working with the task force, when you do seize monies, you can use those monies uh, for technology. Yes, sir. 
of retraining. Yes. And also to aid in, in if you have to cover a cost for transportation or something or part of an investigation and using like another lab or something that you normally wouldn't have access to, you can use it. So it helps. So we can use those monies, which are non-tax dollars, by right. the way. Right. To help us uh, put bad guys away. That's exactly right. So and we're using their money, <clears throat> excuse me, to put them away. Yes, sir. And usually it's a connection from the southern border, southern border directly here. There is a connection. And to be able to have those resources, communication with those other agencies, uh, it's just great. Can you imagine if we didn't, <clears throat> you hear this conversation a lot, and you hear me say this, is, but can you imagine if we didn't have the communication between local, state, and federal mm -hmm. law enforcement? Mm -hmm. uh, not having that communication, it would just, we miss a lot. It, it would. And but it think about the years before we really started working on building those relationships. Right, right. And, and communication is the key. And, and um, again, like I said, it, it's, it's great even on the HSI side of it, um, you know, with, um, um, you got child abduction or you have um, um, trafficking of human trafficking going on. Um, so fraud. it's not just drug trafficking, it's human trafficking it's human also. trafficking, and then you have... Um, major fraud cases, you know, where, where people are stealing people's identity, identity theft. Scams. Scams and things every of that day, Every day. Do, how many times do we talk every, about every day? Yes, sir. There's a new scam. Uh, and Kevin's over here, a crime prevention guy. He's in you know, our public information office. He knows. Yes. We get calls about scams just about every day. Mm -hmm. I'm forwarding something to you. Have you seen this? Have you seen it? And, and our goal is to try to help protect the public and prevent people from being victimized. So, and also working with our public information officer, mm -hmm. Kevin Southard, Lieutenant Southard, we're trying to educate the public ways not to be victimized. Right. So that's why we push that information out. And even on the technology end, um, where we're limited on certain um, equipment, then these agencies with DEA and Homeland Security, you know, can assist us where we can just call them up and, and um, they can do things forensically for us that actually Marcus, helps. go back go back 24, 25 years ago, the technology we had wow. back then, yeah. and look what we have yeah, now. exactly. And look what's at the fingertips of all the investigators. I think it's helping us to do oh, a better job. It's, man, it's, it is tremendously helping Help us. Help us put bad guys away. Yes, sir, it does, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, let, let me ask you something. Yes, sir. Our detectives. Uh, do, they know, do they work normal hours? Do they work Monday through Friday, <laughs> 8 to 5? Off Saturday, Sunday, weekends, holidays? Uh, always? <laughs> Not always. Tell a little bit about that. that. How is it to be a detective? Because well, a lot of people don't know that. Um, detective, it, it, it's, it, can, it can be tough, but, it, but it's good because in the end, you know, our primary goal is to bring relief to the victims. That's our primary goal. And, um, Seek justice. Yes, sir. And yes, their schedules are eight to five, normally that's what they're set up on, but they'd work, believe me or not, they work past five o'clock um, because they're constantly talking to victims after hours, um, other agencies are calling, information is coming in, and usually when that information comes in, I mean, you know, it's not, we sit on it and wait on it the next day, um, we if, get on it right then. If, it, if it's hot, what do we do? We, we, we gotta roll, we, we have to. That's how we um, roll. But yeah, Saturday and Sundays, um, yes, we work weekends. You get calls. You get calls sometimes on the weekend. Uh, um, we get calls on the weekend, and and you know even sometime you may be out with your families, and uh, you may be having dinner, or you may have a special event planned, or whatever. But the phone call comes in, or if they get the call that something major has happened in the county and we need them, then they they have to they have to come. Uh, you interface with Crime Stoppers. Uh, any any advice for people that want to help Crime Stoppers, or if you want to help on solving crimes? We do encourage you to call Crime Stoppers, and, and we understand that, you know, there's a code out there that a lot of people says, well, I don't want to be a snitch, and I don't want to, and, and it's not snitching. You know, I tell people snitches get paid for their, you know, for, for their information. Um, but for Crime Stoppers, we do ask you, um, and, and it's the moral and ethical thing, and that's one of the things that we got to get back to, is when you see something, say something. If it looks suspicious, give us a call and, and let us know. Um, it, it's very hard on investigators so, when, when that information, and we depend on the public. We ask the public's help. We can't do our job unless we have public support. That's right. And Crime Stoppers is a way where a person can report, is, by the way, it's 349 9683. That's right. But if someone wants to report a crime, it's a way you can anonymously report a crime. Nobody knows who you are, mm -hmm. you're assigned a number, mm -hmm. and you could receive up to $1,000 reward for information on, on a crime that's been committed. Uh, you've been involved on a lot of homicide cases. I have. Uh, we've had, and I'll tell you this, is impressive. 
We've had people that have committed serious offenses and turned themselves right in here in the parking lot. Yes, sir. We've had and, that. How many times? And the thing is, it's because you know people, Marcus. You've known people out here, people that you know, people have had a child or grandchild who's messed up, mm -hmm. and you told them, and they've turned themselves right yeah. into you. I've seen it. Yes. So, but that's because people trust you, and uh, again, uh, that confidentiality does mean a lot. It does. Uh, and, and like I said, we would just encourage it. We can't do our jobs without the public talking yeah, to we us. We have to have the public. And, and if you, like, again, and I, I strongly um, encourage you, if you see something, please, you know, give us a call. And like I said, a lot of times people don't want to give their names, but there is Crime Stoppers. And, um, you know, we do leave our phone numbers with, with different people that we talk to in the community. You know, just give us a call. And, um, and just let us know. But, the, like, again, the moral and ethical thing is, is let's do the right thing. We have families. Um, you know that are suffering um, because they, they don't have they don't have um, closure. Yeah, and and, and that's one mm -hmm. of the things that we want to we want to do. And as investigators, we work very hard to try to give those families that closure. Um, I'll, I'll say you work very hard on a case, uh, the French homicides. Yes, sir. And uh, you showed me during your investigation that not only that you had a great team, we have a great team here, but you also on that particular case, I will tell you. You went to other states. We did. Texas, Georgia, Florida. Virginia. Virginia. Um, to, to resolve and, and to prove information through technology, through DNA. That's right. Remember we had that saying that you can run, but you can't hide you can't from what? Hide from, you can't hide from your DNA. You can't hide from your DNA. That's exactly and you right. showed me something. You taught me something in that case. Yes, sir. And uh, you, know, you never forget those things. You traveled a lot. Yes, sir. You made a difference. Um, crime victims. We. Uh, our crime victims, we always try to put them first. That's right. In your in your uh, meeting room where you meet with the detectives on a daily daily basis, beginning every day. Yes, sir. You have pictures of people in there. Can you tell about that? We do. Um, in our conference room, um, we do have um, photographs of unsolved homicide cases that we have. And um, um, remembered but not forgotten is what we have. And, and, and each day that we come in and we do our briefings in the morning, um, the investigators are able to see that and they are able to look at it and know that um, we've got families that we hadn't forgot about them. No homicide that's unsolved is closed. That's right. We are constantly push every year, every year when we come to the holiday month, we come out, we push out the information on that particular case. We do. Because we're hoping that one day somebody will go ahead and come forward and give us information that will make a difference in that case. That's right. Um, let me ask you this. I'm going to get back on crime prevention a little okay. bit. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any crime prevention tips on property, uh, like serial numbers, any property, uh, anything special you would advise people, homeowners and stuff? Uh, you know, we've just come out of the holiday season, mm -hmm. but still, any any like any thoughts that you might want to give to the public on on just cr general crime prevention? Oh yeah. Um, the biggest thing is is serial numbers. That that's the biggest thing that we ask for uh, is to you know write your serial numbers down, keep them in a safe place. Um, on your jewelry, um, you know, firearms, take photographs of these things um, because we do have criminals that do know that's one of the things that we look for, serial numbers, um, identifying marks that you can put on there um, and they'll try to shave these things off of them. But if you can take photographs of them, a lot of times when we're, when we're running um, through pawn shops or other agencies may run across where they've been able to do a big seizure and property has been collected because we do have criminals to go from ages from state to state, jurisdiction to jurisdiction, and that's the purpose. Another good purpose of communicating with these agencies on a on a daily basis because the the, the criminals that that are in Guilford County, the same criminals that come over to Rock County. They come. Uh, they travel. They do. They travel. Mm -hmm. And so again, like I said, um, identifying marks on your on your property. If you use serial numbers, take photographs. Um, and these things will help us in identifying and be able to, um, if we run across a, a big bus, we can um, take photograph of those and ask the victim, you know, are these, could this be your property? And, um, and then, then that way we'll be able to determine, you know, if it belongs to them or if it, go, if it still belongs to another agency. If you're a victim of a crime, mm -hmm. of any type of crime, you should report it right away. Yes. Um, at a residence where you've got things disturbed, Signs where damage stuff like this. What what recommendations for us not touching? You know, 
Tell about what you, as, what you, where our investigators also tell people. Well, and one of the things not that to disturb people, a crime scene when you you know if if you come home and, and something is different from the way you left it that morning, or if you come in and you find your front door kicked in, um, you know we ask you to call nine one one, and and do not go into the residence. Let us let call the law enforcement. Let us come in. Let's at least clear the, clear the residence. Make sure nobody's still. Let in. the officers first come in doing that preliminary right. investigation. Let them check and make sure it's safe. Right. And we we definitely don't want you touching anything because you know we want to come in and we want to tr process the scene. We want to be able to try to get prints and you know any DNA that we can um, that we can get. So we we ask you to, to not touch it. Try not to disturb the not scene. To, exactly, and just call us and right away. Come oh, right away. Immediately call us. You know, a lot of people think when they're calling nine one one, they're bothering us. They're, no, they're not. They're not. No, they're not. Nine one one is a twenty four seven operation, mm -hmm. just like law enforcement and other public safety across this county and stuff right. like this. How about cars? I got to ask you about this around your home. What should you do when you're at home with your car? The biggest thing is, is lock your doors. Lock your doors. When you hear about car break-ins, yes. a lot of times it's not really a break-in. It's, uh, it's just where somebody left the doors unlocked. Please don't leave valuables in your car, especially in plain view where they can be seen. Whether at home or anywhere else? That's, that, that's exactly right. And, and many times I'm, I'm out and I'm, you know, I'm just observing and watching. And I see where people leave their cars running. I see where people um, don't lock the doors or have pocketbooks with money showing out of their, you know, um, handbag or whatever. But uh, we ask you to secure your items, lock your doors at night, and um, please, you know, um, you know, and the biggest thing is, is if you're out shopping or if you're um, at night, try to park in litted areas, um, you know, park in the light. Safe, safe areas. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, so, ladies and gentlemen, lock your doors. That's right. Even at home. Stress that even more. Okay. So we've, we've covered Crime Stoppers. We covered some things, investigations. We covered a little bit about your history. Now, Marcus, are you going to be retiring on me? You're going to be retiring <laughs> on me soon here. We've had a lot of good years together. We've but you had a lot of good when, years. Uh, uh, when do you think you'll be uh, retiring? Um, Sheriff, it looks like it'll be um, probably my last official day will be June 30th. Um, um, but, with, you know, with um, vacation time, I should be able to come but, out but, this, but somewhere this between May and June of this year. Well, I know we're going to come to a close. But I want to tell everybody out there that we have thoroughly enjoyed working with you. You're a professional. You're a good person. You care about your community. You care about our citizens and stuff like this. You care about this agency. And we appreciate you. And, and uh, Well, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, Sheriff, thank you. And I thank you for giving me the opportunity um, to serve. And um, it's been an honor to serve the citizens in this county. Um, one of the things that was my heart's desire when I got into law enforcement was to try to make a difference. You know, you may not can change um, in New York or you may not can change across seas, but you can do work in your community. You can make a difference in your community. And if each person works to try to make a change in their own particular area, then we all can come together and make the big change. One person at a time. That's right. One person at a time. That's right. Well, we're coming to a close. Enjoy it. January. Sheriff Spotlight. Yes, sir. 2021. I'd like to thank you, Marcus, for thank your you, service sir. to the citizens of Rockingham County. Thank you. We're going to recognize you down the road yes, here, sir. but I wanted to say this, spotlight you a little bit today. This is the Sheriff Spotlight on behalf of the Rockingham County Sheriff's Office. I'd like to thank you and also I'd like to thank our citizens. Uh, try to have a, a great month. Yes, and sir. We'll look forward to seeing you in February. All right. Thank you. Thank you.